and just be a part. I feel like I'm a part now. Um, I might not always obey everything. I might not obey the rules and everything. I know I don't. I wore a pair of jeans today. I wore a flannel shirt today. I realize I'm not the knight in shining armor when it comes to uh, my look. I had to get Deborah to get my belt out because these pants are too big, but I wanted to wear jeans today. I got tired of them aggravating uh, jerseys. I just wanted to fit in because I feel like I'm better. I walk better. I think better. I went to the uh, blood doctor and the blood doctor looked at me and read my count and he said that my count was 10.1, which was good on the blood count. He thought that he had given me a shot when I was in the hospital, but I told him, I said, no, I don't, I don't think they did. And uh, he said, well, we'll check it in six weeks and see if your numbers are still good. Well, I'm eating better. I mean, I feel like I am, you know. I feel like I've got maybe a little bit better color I don't know if I do or not, but but I'm grateful. Well, the other day I had to wonder because I just got give out. I get give out when you're standing on your leg and you, you know, I just can't do all the things that I could do before, but. In time, I think maybe it'll come back. I'm not hurting right now in my leg. I mean, I know it's there. I mean, don't think that it doesn't. You, you hit it on something, you'll know that it's there. But, but anyway, well, we're going to jump into James chapter 2. But we're going to select... A few verses out of here. We're not going to read it all. Uh, Gavin, if you got your Bible now, you need to look at where the page is folded and look at chapter 2 and following along. That would really be great that y'all would do that. I want to look at verse 4. Now, how I title this is Questions from James. And I went and I read the whole book of James this week. I went back and I studied on it again. And I couldn't really get it off of my mind. And I'll just be honest with y'all. It's hard to be motivated to look for a message it is difficult. It is hard. And I want to come in here and bring a message that everybody will get something from. I don't want to come in here and waste anybody's time. I don't want nobody leaving out of here saying, you know, Kenny, I didn't get nothing out of that message. But I'll be honest with you, unless you're sitting in this seat right here, you don't know what you're going to say. What I wrote down on my little Farm Bureau paper is the verses of where the question marks was, just for me to remember the verse. So nothing that I've got wrote on my little paper is going to give me the words to expound on. I'm going to have to depend on God to expound on the words that we're going to look at. In chapter 2, verse number 4. Now let's read it. It says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts. Now, let me say this. 
some of these verses is not going to make a whole lot of sense because you're not reading the context. I'm not going back up there reading verse 1 and verse to verse number 3. I'm jumping in at verse number 4. It says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves? How many people do you suspect is partial in any way? I think we all are. But see, he's, t he's letting us know here, are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? It would be so easy to judge somebody for the clothes that they wear or the look that they possess or the kind of person that they're coming across as being. But look at verse number, number 5. You'll notice that verse 5 has a question. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which hath promised, he hath promised to them that love him. Now the only way we're going to really fully understand it is to read that verse over again. Sometimes reading it one time, you get the gist of it. Reading it again, you get a little bit more gist of it. Reading it again gives you a little bit more understanding. I've never seen a verse yet that I've only read one time and said, you know what, Dolores, I got it. Very, very few verses I can actually say that I understand that I got it the first time. There are a few that I can think of off the top of my head that I can say I got it. Give you an example. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I got that one. But you know what? Have I really got it? Could the Lord give me something in that verse that I've not seen yet? Could I talk about the whosoever? See, the word whosoever blows me away. Because it means anybody. It means the drunk. It means the prostitute. It means everybody. Hearken, my beloved brethren. He's saying, hear me. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Are you rich in faith? I hope that we can say that we are. And heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. I'm afraid that there might be some people that don't love him like they should. And I believe that when they stand before God, their testimony is not going to be a good testimony. Does that mean that God's not going to allow them into heaven? No. If they've been saved, if they've been born again of the Spirit of God, they're going to heaven. If every one of us in this room right now has been born again of the Spirit of God, we're all going to heaven. But we're all going to have a different amount of reward. If Dolores loves the Lord more than Sheila, Dolores is going to get a greater reward. Sheila is going to get there. I'm just using this, Sheila, as an example now. I could be talking about that them two doors. If that door right there loved God more than the other door, maybe that would be a better scenario. They're both doors. They both look alike. But one door open, we use that door where the knob is more than we use the other door. 
You know when the other door is used? When you carry a body to the cemetery. If, they're, if they walk a body out them double doors, they open both of them. That one door don't ever get used. How many people is going to enter heaven and they're not going to have a testimony that they was used by God? Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. But look at verse number 6. But ye have despised the poor. See, he's calling them down. Ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Now which judgment seat is he talking about? It's not talking about God's judgment seat. It's talking about their own judgment. If somebody judges me, then they find a reason to judge me. And they have no right to do that. What they have a right to do is to listen to the message and then judge the message for whatever the amount of the message is. They don't have no right to judge me because of what I got on. That ain't, that ain't what makes a minister... I could come in here next Sunday in a three-piece suit and bring the sorriest message that you ever heard. Do I want to do that? No. But look at verse 7. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? How many people blasphemes me? They make fun of me. I post a video. I don't know if y'all know it. Dolores, I post a message every day. Every day. I realize that it's monotonous. But for the people who watch it, I want them to get something from the message. If they're going to sit there and watch garbage, Dolores... I'd rather bring them something to watch. I sent you a video of that testimony of that man in prison. I sent it to you and I sent it to Margaret because I wanted it to be a blessing to y'all. That's the reason I sent it. I didn't send it to Sheila because Sheila has no way to watch it. I could send you one if I knew that you had a phone to watch it, but see, I don't know who's got a phone and who don't have a phone. But see, my job was to send you something that would encourage you. And that man encourages me every time I hear his testimony. The part when he says, and the Lord just loved on me and loved on me and loved on me and loved on me people I want to tell you something that puts chills all over your body when you hear the man just empty himself when the Lord come to him in that prison and y'all got a copy of it waiting for you to watch it again and again and again I bet I've watched it 20 times but I don't ever get tired of hearing it. Because the Lord that come to him loved on him. Loved on him. He loved on me. He loved on me. And see, I cry because I remember the testimony that I sent to y'all. Let's move on to verse 14 in that same chapter 2. Just remember now, we're only looking, we're only looking at the question marks. It says in verse 14, What doeth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now there's a lot that has to do with faith in chapter 2. 
And he's talking a lot about faith. I mean, I forgot to tell you something I want y'all to do for me this week. Being as we've already read chapter 1, if you want to go back and look at chapter 1, you can. But what I want you to do is to go and find time this week to read the rest of James. And it's only five chapters, and you can do it. I did it in an hour's time. But go and read chapter 2 fully. Go read chapter 3, 4, and 5 fully. Because I don't want you to miss any of the words that James is telling us, but we're only talking about the questions that he's asking us today. What doeth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith, Sheila, you can say that you have faith, but where's your proof? Now, a lot of people will say, well, we're saved by faith through grace, not of works. Remember what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says? I can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But what is this saying right here? Though a man have faith and have not works, can faith save him? I can say that I have faith, but if my faith is not really real, can faith save me? If I'm just playing a big fat game with myself? I come in here on Sunday in front of y'all putting on a faith game, and tomorrow and the next day, I don't intend to use faith at all. You know what I am? I'm a big fat liar. And do you think God is going to put up with a big fat liar? that's going to come in here and read the Word of God that don't let faith take action on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and every other day. Does, that, does my faith make me perfect? Does your faith make you perfect? Can faith save him? Look at... Verse number 15, now 15 and 16 goes together. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, meaning they're hungry and they don't have no clothes on, and one of you say to them, depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye gave them not those things which are needful to the body, what doeth it profit? Meaning if I saw a naked person and didn't help them, are they still hungry? Let me give you an example. Deborah gave me this example. And I generally don't want to pick on nobody and I'm not picking on Deborah. She went to Jacksonville the other day. She didn't know I was going to tell this story because she told me the story. So the words came from her. The Lord said, I didn't get digging out of her. She openly told me this story. She takes the kid back and drops him off for play day. She drops the kid off and there's a lady that was sitting in front. Let me tell the story. And then you can fix it if I mess it up. There was an old elderly lady sitting in front of the church that had looked like all her stuff that she owned in her life. She had told Deborah that she had just took a shower. I don't know what was relevant about that. The woman was nice to Deborah. Deborah was even nice to her. Deborah usually don't give nobody the time of day because Deborah didn't know the woman. Deborah didn't know who she was. 
Deborah come home and told me that she felt sorry for the lady because the lady looked like a nice lady. Deborah gave her five dollars to go find something to eat. The woman never asked for no money. The woman, as far as I know, didn't insinuate that she was a beggar. That I think she even told Deborah, look, I'm not asking for your money. But for Deborah to see the woman and to offer the five dollars is something that she wouldn't even give me five dollars. Now, now, now I'm not I'm not being ugly. I'm I'm just I'm just saying that for Deborah to give the lady that she didn't know five dollars, Deborah gives me way more than five dollars to me. But for her to give five dollars to somebody that she didn't know, and here's the thing. She even talked to the lady and even looked for the lady when she went back and the lady wasn't there. You know what else Deborah told me? Now listen to this, y'all, and you get my drift of where I'm going. She even wanted to bring the lady home with her. Now see... She's already got her mama. And Deborah would have never brought her home. I know that. But the want to was there. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that surprised me when I heard that story. Because I thought to myself, that is not Deborah. It just wasn't. I'm just being honest. That wasn't Deborah's character to go and give a stranger five dollars it wasn't her character to show compassion to somebody that you she don't even probably know her name carol, carol. see i didn't know that part She's proven my point. That, that trait is not Deborah. It's just not. I'm not being ugly to Deborah. That's just not the Deborah that I knew. It could be. But see... The point that I'm making is, according to the verse where we are right now, 
If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doeth it profit? If she held on to the five dollars, where would the woman have got five dollars to eat with? So this verse is proving the point. Even though she seemed real happy, even though she was homeless, you know, she was really homeless, and she seemed really happy, you know, even being homeless. Look at verse 20. Here's the next question that James asked. But wilt thou know, O vain? Man, remember what I said about the word vain, empty. O oh, empty man, that faith without works is dead. I can say that I have faith all day long, Dolores, but that doesn't mean that I have faith if I don't put my faith to action. I was happy when I heard that Deborah cared about somebody like that. To me, that's like. Remember the scripture that talks about the angels unaware. I'm going to find that verse to read it to Deborah when I find it. But entertaining angels unaware. There's a verse in the Bible somewhere. It might be in James. I, I don't remember. But she could have entertained an angel unaware. It's possible. Anything is possible. 21, look at 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? We know that story. Remember he took the wood with him, laid the wood out, and had all intention of laying his son on that wood. But guess what God did? As soon as he reared back to take the boy's life, God said, no. There's a lamb or there's a goat in the thicket that's got his head hung in the fence. Go get that and sacrifice that to me. God supplied all he was doing was making sure that he was willing to do it. Does that mean that God tempted him? Did God know that Abraham was going to be successful and that he would go through with the killing? You know what? He could have allowed the knife to go into his son and God could have raised him up again. But God didn't want to hurt that boy. If God was to ask me to do that to Gavin back there, I'd just be honest with you. I'd say, God, you out of your mind. I mean, I'm just being honest, people. I'm just being honest. That kid's not even mine. But I wouldn't hurt that kid for nothing. But see, Abraham... Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? Y'all see that? That word perfect is used there. Does that mean that Abraham was perfect? No, it, he was perfected. Because he still had to live another day. He had to live another month. He had to live another year. And could there have been a time that Abraham could have fell under the load? Yeah, he could have. Look at verse 25 is a question. Likewise also, here's the one we just talked about earlier. 
Was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? Now, Kenny, you're not insinuating that a harlot, a hooker, I'm not trying to belittle any woman in this church. Do you realize there can be man hookers that are just as guilty of doing the same thing the woman has done? But this woman's name happened to be Rahab. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Now some people would judge Rahab. Remember what I said about judging. Some people would judge Rahab because Rahab was a harlot. Rahab didn't deserve heaven. Rahab didn't live a holy life. But ain't it good that God makes that decision? See, Rahab could have turned on them men. But if you remember the story about Rahab, didn't Rahab leave a scarlet ribbon outside the wall of her house? And wasn't it told that the scarlet ribbon would be the protection of her house when the war started and the walls began to fall? Wasn't it Jericho's walls is where she lived at? And her house was built along the side of the wall, but where the ribbon was, the wall didn't fall. The house didn't fall because God said, put a ribbon out the door so that they would know where, what would have happened if Rahab would have said, oh, I ain't worried about it. What would have happened? The house would have fell. And great would have been the fall. So, here we see the question about Rahab. Turn in chapter 3. We're fixing to get done. We don't have many more to go. Chapter number 3, verse 11. I love this one here. This is a message in itself right here. If I hadn't read none of the others, Sheila, this is a message in itself. Doeth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can I take a minute to give you an example of sweet water and bitter? Years ago, when I was a little boy, probably Gavin's age, my daddy had a well dug in Jacksonville. How many people has ever heard of an artesian well? Okay, it's pretty, pretty common. My dad didn't know that he was going to get an artesian well, but that well was 300 feet deep. Very deep well. A deep well, or artesian well, has no need of a pump. The water just flows out. Dad got the guy to put a valve on it so he could turn the water off. After the pond got full, you could turn the valve off. You could open it up a little bit and a little bit of water would come out. But there's a difference between artesian water and bitter water. My grandma had an artesian well that when she made sweet tea, that was about the best taste in sweet tea you could drink. It's from that artesian well. Now some people would say, oh no, the artesian is bad water. Well, if it was bad water, it made good tea to me. But here doeth the fountain send forth at the same place, the same well, sweet water and bitter. 
Today you get bitter water. Tomorrow you go back and get sweet water. He's asking a question right here. Do what the fountains send forth at the same place, sweet water and bitter. He doesn't stop there. He goes on another verse in verse number 12. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Now we know that a fig tree can't bear olive berries. He's not taking up space in the Bible to try to trick you. He's simply calling it the way he sees it. Either a vine, figs. Can figs grow on a vine? We used to have a fig tree where I lived in Jacksonville. You know what would get to the figs quicker than anything else? Birds. You wouldn't want to eat a fig after the bird had opened up the top of the fig. They never mess with the fig on the side. You know why? There wasn't no sweetness on the side. The side had no sweetness. That bird had common sense to peck down in the middle of the fig. Now, as far as I know, Gavin don't even know what a fig tree is. A fig looks like a hot air balloon, Gavin. It looks like a hot air balloon. And the bird would come and tap on the end of the fig to get the goody out of it. But you know what would happen to the fig? If it didn't get off of there in a hurry, it'd rot. So what is he saying here? Can a fig tree, my brother, and bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? The same water that I've got at home is not going to be salty water when I get home and then fresh water tomorrow. No. Look at verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? I started asking myself that question. Who is a wise man that is in front of me? Well, I tell you, they're not in front of me today, right now, but I happen to listen to a minister on the internet that is a pretty wise individual. And I post him a lot on Facebook. And I love his messages because he's factual, he's honest. He is, he is knowledgeable. He doesn't lie. He backs up his word with the word of God. To me, that's valuable in itself. Turn over to chapter 4 and verse number 1. From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence? Even of your lust, that war in your members. What's war in your members today? All kinds of things that we go through. We go through wars. It might not be like a military war, but there's a lot of people that go through wars, fighting. Look at how many times the sheriff's department gets called on a rowdy ruckus of a family. A drunk. Trouble, stealing, all kinds of things. That's what the verse is referring to. Come they not hence? Come they not here? Come they not near? Is what he's saying. Even of your lust, that war in your members. What is lust? Anything that takes our eyes off of Jesus is lust. It don't have to be a sexual thing. We always put the word lust as a sexual thing. It don't have to be a sexual thing. That money that mama left me, Dolores, could be a lust in my mind if I use it the wrong way. 
Ain't got nothing to do with sex. Ain't got nothing to do with it. What is he saying right here? What wars in your members? Look at verse number 5. Here's a question that he asked. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain? There's that word vain again. The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. If I have lust, it's going to turn into more. If lust was a seed and I planted lust in my garden pot, is it going to produce more lust? Sure it will. It's going to turn into greater lust. That's what he's saying right here. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain? Let me say this. When I read this verse, it excited me last night. Just so everybody knows and everybody's listening to me right now, the Scripture says nothing in vain. You're not going to find nothing in the Scripture that is empty. Remember we said the word vain means empty? We're not going to find one verse in the Bible that it means empty. We've read many verses today that talked about the word vain. But God's Word ain't vain. I might not understand it, Sheila. I might not understand everything that I'm reading, but the Word of God is not vain. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit dwelleth in us, lusteth to envy? Is my lust growing envy? Basically, I think that's really what he's trying to say here. Look at verse number 12. Here's another one. Now, let me, let me clarify something why I'm at this point. There might be more questions that I missed. I think I got them all. I don't know of any that I missed. But here's one. In verse number 12, there is one lawgiver. There's only one who is able to save and to destroy. Now, you know what? I like that verse because it says who is able to save and to destroy. You notice which one came first? Save. Does Jesus want to save? Sure he does. Does Jesus want to destroy? No, not one. He didn't want to send that rich man to torment in Luke 16. That man made his own decision to go there. God didn't send him to hell. He made his own decision to go there. Because he didn't believe in God. Did God love that man? Sure he did. God created him from the foundation of the world. God saw that that man was a baby at one time. Did God love that man? Did he want that man's riches to be everything in his life? No. But that man made a decision to be wealthy and to let his wealth take him down, take him out. There is one lawgiver. Who is the one lawgiver? Jesus the Christ. He's only one. Who is able to save and to destroy. Does he want to destroy? No. Does he want to save? Yes. Who art thou that judgest another? See, we're getting right back to where we was before when we was talking about judging. There's people that judge, and they have no right to judge. And it says right there, Who art thou that judgest another? Do you think these people in James was a judge? Why would he point it out? 
if they wasn't a judge? Why would I take the time to look at the questions if none of us was guilty of judging? Why would I even want to bring it out today? Why did James bring it out? Because he saw that people was judging. Now, in, ver in chapter 5, in verse number 13... Is any among you afflicted? Now that word afflicted is talking about sickness or afflicted in some way. Right now, my leg is afflicted right now. It's not well by no means yet. But the Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? What's the answer that James says immediately? Let him pray. Let him, he's talking about the brethren, but he's also talking about women too. Don't think for a moment that just because James is using the word brethren that he ain't talking about y'all. We don't have but one other little male in here and he's, he's, he's laying on grandma's belly. And you got me as a male. He's not talking to just the brethren. He's talking to everybody that's listening. That's the reason he says here, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? M-E-R-R-Y? Norma, I'm glad you get up there and play that piano. And if you want to have a miniature seizure next time, then I'll know what's happening. Had Margaret not mentioned it, I wouldn't have known it. But see, now that I know that if it happens again, I can sit here and say, Lord bless Norma. Let it pass. This too shall pass. Let it pass. If anybody didn't feel good, I'd like to be able to know that I could intercede in some way. In some way. I'm fixing to tell on me before I get done with this message. I'm fixing to tell on myself because I already see where I'm guilty right here where I'm reading at right now. Is any Mary let him sing psalms? Some people maybe would think that the songs that we sung today wasn't all that big a deal, but I want to tell you something. Didn't you play Tell Me the Story of Jesus? I love that song. Am I telling the story of Jesus today in the message? I hope so. I hope that's what I'm attempting to do and not be on the piano because I don't know how to play the piano. I couldn't be no blessing to y'all being on the piano because I don't know how to play the piano. Look at verse 14 before you close your Bible. This is the last verse right here. Is any sick among you? Now it mentioned the word afflicted. Now it's using the word sick. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Y'all see that now? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him or her, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now you know, I like if y'all would let me, I'm not crazy. I'd like, I've got plenty of them little Walmart prescription bottles that we just throw away. I'd like to be able to take one 
and put a little bit of olive oil and put it right up there. Do you? See, I did not know that. I did not know that. And see, my point that I'm making is, if somebody wanted prayer, would we be able to follow what the Bible says? Some people would say, you're getting Pentecostal on this now. You know, when you start that, you know, we're getting into, we're getting into another realm. No, we're going by what the Bible says. Let me make just a quick statement. Sheila, you don't look the best in the world today. Are you sick? You don't feel good? She just looks different. You just look different. She looks kind of pale. Yeah, you, I, that's a word. See, even she said you look pale. I was pale and didn't even know it. That's the reason that I asked if she felt good because she just didn't look like she felt good. I might be wrong. But the scripture says here where we was just at, and let them that pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then it goes on, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So here's, here's where I'm going to tell on myself. You remember where the verse said? Let me read it because I want to make sure I get it right. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. Maybe I need to back up. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Now this is my point. And I need y'all's help in this. I need to pray more. I'm just being honest with y'all. I need to pray more. I can come and bring a message and feel like the Lord's anointing the message, but there's times that I just don't pray like I need to. And I'm just admitting the fact that I don't pray like I need to. Now, God don't expect me to pray beside my bed and hold my hands like this and pray like a little kid and get on my knees every day. I don't think the Lord is asking me to do that. The kind of prayer that I believe the Lord deals with me in is just pray like I would be talking to Sheila. It's not the amount of time, Sheila. Pray like I'm talking to the Lord. How much did I talk about you when you had the seizure up there? Very little. But my point is, I needed to pray. I didn't know until Margaret mentioned it. And I guess maybe she didn't know until you mentioned it to her. See what I mean? See what I'm getting at? So I need to pray more. So I can, yes, I can bring a message. And I hope that this was enjoyable to look at the questions that James has asked us. But when you go home and you open up your Bible to James chapter 2 and you start reading, you're going to find a whole lot more stuff. What I did was just give you a little... What did they call that when you go to the store, Deborah, and they got food laying out and they got the food with the toothpicks in it? I remember years ago when Sweet Sue Chicken and Dumplings first came out, nobody knew what it was. They opened up a couple of cans, they spread it out that Sweet Sue, and they put a toothpick in each of them. 
And there's no telling how many cans they sold because somebody took the time to open up a few cans to let somebody taste it. But I will tell you this, the sweet Sue today don't taste like the sweet Sue of 10 years ago. It just don't get it. The gravy ain't the same. The taste ain't the same. Deborah's not making it any different. The same microwave that warmed it up 10 years ago is the same microwave that is warming it up today. The product is different. It could, could be. But I need prayer. I want y'all to pray that when the Lord gives me an idea, this was an idea that the Lord gave me and and honestly, I had to judge myself. Is this the message that the Lord wants me to bring to the church? Is it fair? Is it, is it fair for, for me to even, even be quizzed about the questions? Did the Lord ask me the question? If the Lord took time for me to see the questions, is it right for me to pose the questions to you all? If it's fair for me to see the question, I can't beat my own self up. And I'm not here to beat nobody else up. But I'd like to be able to know that when I get home today, and I get Gavin on my recliner and I start trying to tickle him that I say, Gavin, what did Papa talk about in church on Sunday? What did I talk about? That kid's getting to be where he's smart. He listens. He's talking like a little adult and it scared me. I even told his mama yesterday, I said, you got a man on your hands. Me and him used to sort of fight with one another, and I can still whip him. I'm talking about holding him. I can, I can still grip him. But I want to tell you something. When he starts to squirm, he's testing my strength. And if he, can, if he continues to fight me, I'm going to have to let him go because I can't hold him. I ain't going to tell him that because I don't want him to think that he's going to win. I still want to be able to hold him even tighter. But I need prayer. If you don't get nothing else out of this, that there convicted me. Kenny, you're not even doing what the Bible says yourself. And you're bringing words to these people here. And you're not even obeying. See, that story that Deborah told was an inspiration to me. It shows that there's hope. I hope that Deborah takes that Bible of hers and don't leave it zipped up, but go and open up that Bible, Dolores, and read James chapter 2 and three, and four, and five, and I don't have to say nothing about her doing it. I want her to do it because there might be something there for her that would be encouragement. There's already a verse in the Bible that already was aimed right at her. Deborah didn't want that woman to go without food. On Saturday of all days. I'm proud of her. Was it, was it, I don't remember what day it was. It don't matter what day it was. The bottom line is she cared. And she could have entertained the angels unaware. And I believe that is in Hebrews 13, I think.
Ain't that something? Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, there's a part of a verse that comes to my mind, and I don't know where it is, but I only know part of it. The Bible talks about take heed lest ye fall. Take, we might have read that today and I don't even remember it. But there's a verse that there's more to it than that. But the Bible said take heed lest ye fall. So the next time that Deborah sees somebody, you don't never know when she might entertain angels unaware and there is a Bible verse in the Bible that talks about entertaining angels unaware. And we're around angels all every day. Dolores, when you go down to Family Dollar down there in St. George, you might entertain angels unaware and don't even know it. And that could be anywhere. Look at the angels that could have been entertained with all the people that went in her restaurant over all them years she worked there. Look at the people that saw Margaret as an example of humility. I mean, it's incredible. So God looks at each one of us in our own way. So I'm grateful. I hope you got something from the message. Go read chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5. And if you happen to see any question marks that I missed... Write them down, and we'll talk about them. If you happen to see one that I didn't cover, write it down and bring it in to me. I'd love to know because there was a couple that I called out today that I didn't see the second and the third question mark until I went back and looked harder, and there they was right in front of my eyeballs, but I didn't see it the first time. Didn't see it the second time. I can take you to the verses. And the ones that I added to the list, I added them to the list because my eyes focused on the question mark. So, God is good. God is good. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that this little kind of message wasn't just done in vain. Lord, that you guided even in the questions that James asked us, and we're not even seeing James today. We don't know what James looks like. We don't know if he was a fat man or a skinny man. But we do believe that he was somebody that you knew because you used him to write the book of James. And Lord, he honored you with his words. And he honored you with his lips that he told the brethren that we just read about. So Lord, thank you. Help us always to be able to see the person in need that we could entertain angels unaware even if it ain't nothing but giving a gospel track. Lord, help us to just implant the seed to a person that maybe might not know who you are. And Lord, if there's someone in this room today that don't know you, then it's going to be hard for them to relate to this kind of message. Because the questions really can't be aimed at them because it was aimed at the brethren. It was aimed at the people who were saved. 
And this man James didn't waste his time speaking to the infidel. He was speaking to the people of God. So Lord, help us, Lord, to speak the truth. Lord, if there's someone here today that don't know you, Lord, I just pray that they will be humble enough to seek you out. Let them get in the Word. Let them find out if their walk of life is vain or not. If their walk of life is empty or not. Lord, you're able to help the people to understand. You're able to deal with the person that is lost. Help us, Lord, to just be open to you and your will and your way. Bless us as we come back next week. Give us your idea of the message, Lord. Lord, this was an idea that maybe it had personal motive. But Lord, I pray it was all about you and not about me. Help people to understand the calling that I have in being seated in front of these people. And Lord, I don't take it for granted. I, I, I believe that you sent me to deliver your word, even if it ain't but just to a few people. Lord, a few has a right to eat of your food. And Lord, we have an opportunity to come and eat of your food. Help us, Lord, to eat, Lord. And let us have a big fat appetite of wanting more of you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.